In this episode, I'm joined once again by writer and occultist John Michael Greer. We discuss the upcoming 2020 US election between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, alongside discussions on contemporary politics, modern conservatism, the ongoing occult war, Pepe, Keck, John's upcoming book, The King in Orange, which documents occultism alongside contemporary politics, and more. I'd like to thank all my paid subscribers and patrons for making all of this possible, and if you would like to support Ometics or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. So, John Michael Gray, welcome uh, welcome once again to Hermitics Podcast, and thanks very much for coming on. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It's always a pleasure. Uh, so we, this is sort of a US 2020 election special, uh, dealing <laughs> with the, the boring dystopia of uh, contemporary democracy, uh, but made less boring by the soon to be published, uh, to be published in June in the UK, not sure the publication dates in the US, but your, your book, The King in Orange, which you sent me a few, uh, preliminary, um, writings, which are, can be found on your blog, uh, Echo Sophia. Um, about mm-hmm. Keck and about Pepe and about Trump and about Chaos Magic, um, which we will which we will dive into. But uh, a few sort of boring, t- seemingly boring questions before we get in. As we're talking about politics, do you still <laughs> sort of uh, identify as a, a Burkean conservative? That's correct. Okay, a okay. moderate, a moderate Burkean conservative. That's that's my usual identifying moniker. And one of the great things about it is that it confuses the bejesus out of everybody. <laughs> How would you describe it in like in, in a couple of sentences? Okay, um, a couple of sentences. Well, no, a couple of sentences. To, we'll, would, we'll go for a par- yeah. we'll go for a short paragraph here. Okay. okay, Edmund Burke was was the founder of Anglo-American conservatism. Um, he was active in the 18th century, and um, his basic point was that human beings are much less smart than they think they are. And so when a bunch of people, especially when a bunch of intellectuals, comes up with a wonderful new scheme to reform everything and make a perfect world, the thing you know is going to happen is what happened when the French did that after the French Revolution, when the Russians did that after the Russian Revolution, fill in the blanks. Um, It's going to be a complete disaster. The political systems we have, the institutions we have, problematic, boring, troublesome, annoying as they are, have one virtue. They have been proven to work at least to some extent. Um, better, for example, than uh, the government, uh, the 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 um, governments that were imposed by, say, the French and Russian revolutions. Um, they also tend to kill fewer people than these marvelous new, brilliant ideas that get put into place. And so, Burke's idea was that, of course, reform is needed. Of course, improvement is possible. But you do it a bit at a time. You find a problem, you fix it. You don't tear the whole thing down and proclaim the, you know, the glorious republic of what have you, and then start killing people. In, in the sort of usual revolutionary fashion. You fix things one at a time. You also don't assume that everybody has the same needs, everyone has the same wants, everyone has the same, uh, same desires in life. You don't go and take a set of ideas, for example, that are popular among upper middle class intellectuals and say, well, everyone should live like this. That works very poorly. You let people make up their own minds how they want to live, and you don't spend a lot of time ramming your ideologies down their throats. That's Burkean conservative conservatism. That's that's kind of my viewpoint. Okay. Are you are you yeah? You mentioned the French Revolution a couple of times. There. Are you? Would you be sympathetic to a monarchy? Um. Well, I, the thing is, monarchy has monarchy obviously has its problems. Although monarchies work very well if they're constitutional. You know, you have a monarch, you have a, a representative government under the monarch, you have some kind of relationship between them. Um, Britain and Japan have been both, um, you know, relatively in recent times, they've both had relatively stable, relatively functional political environments in that they've got a monarch who is kind of the, um, the, the, the strange attractor for people's ideas of the identity of the country and things like that, and, and a, a royal or imperial family um, to serve as, as the sort of soap opera end of things. And then you have the, the actual business of governing being done um, by a bunch of bland, mostly faceless bureaucratic types. Um, it's a much better idea. Here in the United States, on the other hand, we load the energies of monarchy onto an elected official, and that works very poorly. The the U.S. president, uh, when they use the exec, uh, when they take uh, executive powers, basic for mm-hmm. practical purposes, a monarch, uh, a constitutional monarch. But yes, especially these days with um, 
you know, with the executive orders and the signing statements and all this, frankly, unconstitutional stuff that is built up around the, the office of the presidency. Um, it's very much the kind of situation of a of oh say George the third comes to mind back back in the days when the monarch still had some significant political power. Um, he's constrained by Congress, but only in certain ways, and he can certainly make a lot of first rate mistakes and mess things up comprehensively all by himself. Again, George the third comes to mind. Huh. Okay, so that brings me to uh, probably one of the most troublesome political words floating around just all the time in everyone's ears. Um, and I think we've, we've got to the point where we, we, we ignore it. And I'm thinking of the D word, democracy. Um, <laughs> now, this people are probably wondering what the hell has this all got to do with Pepe and uh, occult and uh, oh, we'll chaos magic. But, but there, is a, there, is a, there is a trail, and it's, it's, I think it's an important trail. But I think mm-hmm. really it, begin, it does actually begin, in a certain sense, not necessarily with democracy, but what we even understand as democracy. So my first question Mm -hmm. really is because Biden versus Trump or, you know, um, blue versus left or left, uh, sorry, blue versus red or left versus right. This is what we, we sort of think of as democracy. Now, my question would be is, do you think this is a democracy as democracy is sort of initially, uh, is theorized? (laughs) Okay. The word democracy is one of those words that serves, a. It, it, it's kind of a, a kind of a dumpster for people's um, imaginations. People say, oh, we want democracy. What they mean by that is we want to get everything they want. And we want those other guys to get screwed. That's what, you know, when people say democracy, they say, I get the power. Um, a democracy in the real sense of the word is a system where people get to vote to choose um, the people who make major decisions about their lives. That's all it is. It is not a utopia. It is not guaranteed to function well. In fact, democracy has a lot of problems. Pervasive corruption. If I mean, if you give everyone the vote, some people are going to sell their votes, either directly for cash or indirectly to, the, to whoever promises them the most. So you're always going to have corruption of one kind or another in a democrat society. Um, democracy, you know, it's, it's prone to fans. It has uh, to, democ- democratic governments always have incredibly short term um, capacities for planning. They literally can't think ahead of the next election. And that's, that's the nature of the beast. Mm-hmm. Now, does this mean democracy is awful? We ought to get rid of it and put in some new, exciting, you know, or, or redefine democracy so that it does what we want? No. Awful as it is, representative democracy works better than most of the alternatives. It kills fewer people. It imprisons fewer people unjustly. It has a far better track record in terms of human rights violations. Now, are there human rights violations under democracy? Of course, there are lots of them, but it's much worse in a tyranny. So it's one of these situations where, okay, what we have, what we have sucks. What they have in the People's Republic of China or in North Korea, it sucks considerably more. So, you know, <laughs> again, here's the Berkey and conservative. You have something that more or less occasionally works some of the time. Don't scrap it and replace it with something that will never work at all. Mm-hmm. So the options are it sucks or it sucks more. So I'm certainly, exactly. sen- certainly sensing your uh, influence from Schopenhauer there. Um, <laughs> But, yeah. but, well, the thing is, human beings are human beings. Nothing is going to make them act like angels. The great flaw of, of the leftward end of the political spectrum is this notion that if we only get the right political system in place, then everyone will suddenly shake their heads and say, what was I thinking? How could I have been so selfish and stupid? Of course I'll do the right thing all the time. It never works. Human beings are human beings. I forget who was the German thinker who said, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. Uh, is is I a Berlin? Mm-hmm. I think so. Um, but just as a digression on, on democracy, like I, I've heard it said, you know, if we just, I, since I mentioned Schopenhauer, I suddenly thought of Nietzsche. And the fact that, mm-hmm. you know, Nietzsche is critiquing religion because it's the absolute main, like the, the sort of, the diehard, center post of all values of his time mm-hmm. and so he's he's critiquing this thing which is so absolutely evident that it's not questioned and i've i've heard it said that you know if he was around today he would be questioning democracy he'd be questioning liberalism do you think that would mm-hmm. be the case oh yes the thing is he did question democracy he he actually ripped into democracy he ripped into everything this is nature <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, if if people believe in it, he's poking it with a pin going, OK, how hard do I need to poke this before it either yelps or pops? Um, that was his whole mission was to look at the unquestioned values of society and say, ha, OK, what does this actually mean? And so, yes, um, if if Nietzsche were if Nietzsche were suddenly to be cloned from one of his mustache hairs or something and were, you know, shake himself awake and, and, and you know, get some get some newspapers and so on, try to figure out what was going on in the world, he'd be questioning democracy, he'd be questioning equality. <laughs> he would be questioning the entire idea of justice, social and otherwise. He would be questioning yes, liberalism. He'd also be questioning the, the conservatism we got now we have nowadays. Um Again, his idea is you subject everything to inquiry, and the more sacrosanct it is, the more it needs to be questioned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, you've you've mentioned conservatism there, and uh, you know, as you identify as Birkin conservative, I mean, obviously that is entirely separate to uh, the contemporary conservatism we have in the, mm -hmm. in the U.S. and the U.K. Um, what what are uh, what are they conserving exactly? You see, that's the great question. <laughs> um, most, I mean, the the pro we we had this really bizarre process that that went and in in all I think all of the English speaking countries went through this process um, in the wake of the of the Great Depression. An enormous number of conservatives stopped being conservative, and then the liberals followed suit. Um, I will mention the name of Tony Blair here. Um, you know, they just so we have we have a we have a political context full of liberals who have forgotten how to liberate and conservatives who've forgotten how to conserve. And they're, what 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 they're doing is pandering to the attention of the managerial class, the class that actually holds power in today's society, and that's why. You know, with all these big, important social issues that everyone brandishes around, the issue, the big issues, the issues that haven't been talked about until quite recently, have to do with the concentration of power in the hands of a managerial class, and it's until recently bipartisan, or in in your country, tripartisan, um, lackeys and hangers on. It's crazy to think about, like when uh, I'm only 26, but even my sort of earliest memories of the Labour Party was just on that sort of. But they're still clutching to, you know, unions and workers' rights and the things mm -hmm. that Labour, you know, should be should be gunning yeah. towards. A, and a, a Labour Party, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Rather than doing the Blairite thing of, of selling out to the to to um, neoconservatism abroad and neoliberalism at home and saying, well, you know, they'll vote for us anyway. And yet they were still surprised that Brexit happened, and they were still mm -hmm. surprised that the Tories got in, even though they campaigned harder in working class areas, and they they were still surprised. The, the, the thing, this is actually one of the things that I find most fascinating about the entire thing. And, of course, that's true here. Yeah, it mir um, mirrors America. That's what I was exactly. Mir he, we, we had, I, I read this article a little while ago. I've forgotten the, the, the title, but it was by the executive director of one of the big um, online magazines. And he was emoting about the possibility that Trump would win re-election. And one of the things he said was that the, you know, Donald Trump's election was not reasonable. It was not um, – it was not comprehensible. It was this bizarre eruption of, 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 of you know, total chaos. I forget the exact word. They were hilarious. Mm -hmm. This guy had literally fallen into the trap of believing that the universe is obliged to cater to his political prejudices. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them believe that. A lot of them have bought into this weird form. I would call it magical thinking, except I practice magic, and I don't think that way. No practical magic. No practical magician does anything, thinks anything like that stupidly. Um, the notion that the universe is designed to give them the outcomes they want, and if those outcomes don't show up, if Brexit gets voted for, if Bojo gets voted in, if Hillary Clinton gets voted out, then there has been an irreparable breach in the fabric of reality through which, no doubt, tentacled horrors will start sl sl you know, slithering shortly. This is, this is probably my um, biggest frustration with the left in terms mm -hmm. of, in terms of, you know, in a sense, I think if they understood it, they could help themselves, but also yeah. just frustrations in terms of like freedom, which is, mm -hmm. as you were stating, everything that goes their way is correct. And everything mm -hmm. that doesn't go their way isn't an opinion, isn't a choice from the other side, is a bug. It's not a feature. It shouldn't, it, it's not a, it's not the other side perhaps wanted the other thing. It should not have happened, as you were saying. It's an absolute incorrect thing. And so they're always caught in a paradox of, you know, A has happened, but B should have happened. Trump got in, and, and they just cannot admit to it. It's, it's bizarre. 
bizarre. Mm-hmm. This is why I end up going to Lovecraftian metaphors because <laughs> it's like it's like Neogtha, who is one of the, one of the critters of that of the Cthulhu mythos. His his title is the thing that should not be, <laughs> and so I think of Brexit as the thing that should not be. This you know this vast cosmic horror slithering up from out, from out of the depths of the electorate, <laughs> and. You're right. It, it would be one thing if they simply said, okay, we lost, but that they can't deal with the fact that they could lose, that it is not within their their, their range of possible mental states just to recognize that, for example, they ran, they ran a lousy campaign. Mm-hmm. It's almost like a Lovecraftian language, like you open a book in a Lovecraft novel and they, you just, you know, the human mind cannot grasp it. On one page, exactly. is, the le- on one page is the left wing winning the other one is the right but that's in a language you just go no 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 and, and go into full yeah, exactly. blown horror mode so, 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 so in other words in other words the british electorate opened the brexit nomicon <laughs> you know and, and and the entire the entire managerial cast shrieked in horror as their brains you know turned liquid and dribbled out their ears it would explain so much <laughs> so do you think do you think I mean, before the the twenty sixteen election, first time Trump Trump got in. Well, mm-hmm. the, the only time so far. So far, because I, you know, I if I was to put money on it now, I'd like Trump's going to get in. That's my call. Um, but I'm sure we'll get into that. But but when he when he um, first got in, I remember a lot of people saying they were voting for Trump because they just wanted change. And and it mm-hmm. seems to me that you know Hillary at the time and the other options were as you were saying they all just represented this managerial class and so so mm-hmm. so many people were saying oh you want change you want chaos you want fascism it's like no 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 we just don't want to be on this managerial like middle class mm-hmm. managerial route anymore and that was it mm-hmm. um do do you think that's why he he won well that's an important part of it because seriously all of the candidates that we had in 2016 except for Trump were basically pushing versions of the same thing um more globalism of the economy, meaning more mass unemployment, what, more open borders, meaning more mass unemployment, more regulations, meaning fewer small businesses, more, more money flowing to the big corporations. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole, it was the whole neoliberal kit, and they were, they were bickering about tiny issues, and the, the major players were hardly even doing that. They were doing the Obama routine. You, you remember when Obama um, won in, in 2008, he didn't even have a platform. It was hope, change. Yes, we can. Totally vacuous, mindless, meaningless sound bites um, around a smiley face. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's what, that's what everyone is doing. Just, we all agree, you know, they, they were all pushing the same policies. They were all supporting the same class interests. Interests that had seen the American working class driven into poverty and misery for 40 years. And so when Trump said around, said, we're going to do something different, a huge number of people rallied to him purely because it was something other than the disastrous neoliberal, neoliberal policies that everyone else was offering. And then when he noticed this, and this is, this is the thing, people think Trump's stupid, but that's, you know, I should say liberals think Trump's stupid because they think everyone who disagrees with him is stupid. In fact, he's extremely clever. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that's clever about him is that he noticed what people were reacting to. He noticed what interested them and, and proceeded to, to make it the center of his platform. And so by the time that his campaign really got rolling, um, by the middle of 2016, um, he had these ex- this extensive platform, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And all of them were the things that a vast number of Americans wanted to see and that no other candidate was offering them. So, you know, he won, despite the massed opposition of all of the media, all the political class, all the pundits, the entire structure of American political domination. Yeah, and it's something you you mentioned there with respect to Obama is sort of a good 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 segue here into the, the magic aspect of this. Because mm-hmm. you mentioned, you know, yes we can and just the word hope in that uh, I think it was Shep- mm-hmm. Shepherd Fairy poster with, you know, sort of um, <laughs> uh, almost like neo Soviet you know, pseudo communist sort of like, you know, you can uh-huh. imagine your fist raising to the sky. And 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 I think yes we can is sort of the best example of in New Age spirituality, this would probably these would be called like that's an affirmation. Uh, mm-hmm. and for, and I think for anyone who doesn't know what an affirmation is, it's like if you want 
um, wealth. You just consistently say that over, very roughly, you say that to yourself or you keep that thing in your mind. Or if you want to look for opportunity, you, you, you know, say to yourself, mm-hmm. I'm going to find opportunity today, you know, in some sort of mm-hmm. vague ritual along those lines. And affirmations, mm-hmm. I think, has a history as many other names, positive thinking, um, mm-hmm. sort of self, self fulfilling prophecies, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it, it goes way back. Um, mm-hmm. yes, we can is exactly the same thing, except the problem is there's no teleology to that. Because it's like mm-hmm. every single, I don't know if you'd agree, but because of the atomization, everyone's like, yes, we can. But each and every person's going, it's the problem of democracy once again. Yes, we can. Uh, there's a, there's an end. There should be an end to that sentence, right? Yeah. And that's the problem. So really all that energy is just being channeled into, yes, we can get you in power. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so we, by the by, by Obama's second term, one of the most effective things that people on the right were saying was so how is that Hopi changey thing <laughs> working out for you now? Because of course it didn't, <laughs> and that was it. Yes, we. It, the thing is, if I may, if I may refer to to affirmations, mm-hmm. a good affirmation is specific. Mm-hmm. A good affirmation is it, it's focused. It actually directs the will toward a goal. You know, yes, we can do this. Yes, we can do that. That would have been effective. But as a slogan, you know, it's like love trumps hate. Hillary Clinton's failed, famous failed slogan. Um, it doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. It's just this sort of evocation of warm, fuzzy feelings. And that is ineffective magic, among other things. And goes a long way to explain why um, why Hillary's came. Well, I mean, there were many reasons why Hillary Clinton lost that election, an election that she should have been a shoe in for. But that was one of them. Do you think? Do you think actually, uh, on a sort of on a, a spiritual level, that's why um, the reaction to the loss is that this energy that was built up, you know, the reaction to the loss was hysterical. I don't think there's uh, any. I don't think there's another way to describe it. Do you think that's actually why it was hysterical? Because there was almost like the the valve of this, you know, bomb of energy got let out, but it got, you know, mm-hmm. it wasn't meant to. It got burst. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you, you see. I, I think I think you're massively understating it by saying the response was hysterical. <laughs> I would say that it was a full blown psychotic break. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, as in you know, call the nice men in the white uniforms with the straight jackets, um, kind of psychotic break. And we're still in the middle of that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here in the United States, certainly. Um, but yeah, um, they built up this huge, this huge mass of emotion, which was intended to be tapped by the campaign, except they weren't any good at it. Um, and you know, Hillary, Hillary Clinton, one of her one of her great disadvantages is she's one of the least inspiring speakers in American public life today, and that's saying an enormous amount. Yeah, especially when you've got, Biden, so, especially when you've got yeah. Biden stood there. Yeah, I say Biden. Biden is right up is, is is right up there. I mean, th- those those two are probably, you know, put those two in a loser take all speaking competition. And I think you you know, if you have problems with insomnia, we can fix this. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, the the thing is, they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know what they were doing with energy. A lot of people on that end of politics and in the in the social class to which Hillary and many of her supporters belong, they have these very vague ideas that they've absorbed from, you know, sort of pop culture spirituality. A few affirmations here, a little new new age, um, warm fuzzy there, maybe some mindfulness meditation, which we can get into that. Um, and it doesn't give them any effective tools. And of course, one of the major stories of what happened was that the other side suddenly found itself with some working tools and put them to use. Yeah. So, I mean, let, yeah, let's dive into The King in Orange because, well, you know, I know it's not... What's the publication date in America? Um, should be the same time as in England. Should be okay. June. June. Or thereabouts. Um, um, you, it's, there's always a certain amount of, of wiggle going around, and I still have final revisions to do. Okay, cool. Um, so this, this, as I understand it, it's about the, the, the sort of occult background and occult uh, and magical mm-hmm. foundations of uh, sort of contemporary politics and, and politics yeah, generally. Yeah, that's, that's um, correct. Now, when we did our last episode, the, the, the only other book that's sort of doing this, at least in the contemporary era, uh, came up. And you briefly said you weren't a fan of it. And I think it's interesting to, to see why in comparison to your book. And, of course, that's um, Gary Lackman's Dark Star Rising, mm-hmm. which is, uh, tr- mm-hmm. is called Trump in the... Trump in the age of I can't remember. Trump in the age of magic. Yeah, it's, or it's magic, magic and power in the age of Trump. That's the yeah. one. That's um, one. Yeah, it's 
it's it's an interesting it's an interesting book, and of course, Lachman had the great advantage that he was writing quite early on in this process, and I also don't think he particularly had his ear to the ground with regard to what was going on in the sort of magical under um, subcultures. Um, I don't. It's been a while since I've read it, although I'll be re- rereading it shortly. Um, but I don't think he was at all tuned in to what to what was going on, what the alt right actually was. What was taking shape out there in you know among the um, people who were going to Fort Chan and Eight Chan and places like this, and how that played in? He was very fixated on um, the 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 so-called traditionalists, which is a little intellectual fringe group. Um, I can offend every traditionalist who listens to this by saying it was a spin-off of Theosophy, but that's basically the case. Um, a, a couple of European intellectuals in between the wars. Um, took exception to the liberal bias of the Theosophical Society and its teachings and set out to come up with much the same thing, a pastiche of of old spiritual traditions, which they claimed were the real authentic tradition handed down you know, mm-hmm. from, from, from eternity, blah, blah, blah. Um, of course, it was nothing of the kind. <laughs> if you read René Guénon, if you read Julius Evola, you will find a rehash of standard of, of standard intellectual fodder of the early 20th century. You can often go through, like, like go through Evola's uh, Revolt Against the Modern World. You can mark paragraphs. Say, okay, this one's okay. Here's Bakoven. Here's some Nietzsche. Here's some Schopenhauer. Um, let's see. Oh, there we go. You know, and to just literally go down his sources. It's quite it's quite amusing. Um, but they were they've they've kind of been burbling along as an alternative spiritual tradition for some time now, and some people, notably um, Steve Bannon, who was briefly an advisor to Trump, are heavily into them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Lachman built that up into this vast you know this vast structure of evil traditionalists and sinister Russian agents. Of course, there had to be the Russians and all this kind of stuff. And he missed, he frankly missed everything significant that was going on, but. You know, again, he was writing early on, and I don't think he had a, he has much of an ear to the to the ground in the in you know the, the run of the mill ordinary occult community where you know folks who do not publish books, folks who do not um, who are not pundits, who do not um, have widely read websites or what have you, the place where those people hang out. Mm-hmm. And my good fortune is that I do have such connections because I reached my current status as a very, very, very minor internet celebrity um, the hard way, one step at a time, starting with you know with some books that didn't sell very well and some blogs then and, and a blog that at the beginning you know got maybe three comments a week. Because because from memory, Lackman focuses on Trump's Trump attended the lectures of is it William William Pierce. No, no, you're thinking. Oh, come on. Um, yes, uh, Norman Vincent Peale. Sorry, um, I yes, know when why Trump, I said William Pierce. Yes, no, no, no. When Trump was a boy, his dad took him to the church where re- the Reverend Norman Vincent Peale um, did his was was the pastor. Uh, Peale was a was a big name at the time. He was kind of a Christian New Thought figure. Um, toward the toward this, the, the new, new thought is kind of the pre, the predecessor of new of the new age. It's um, the new age is basically new thought plus psychotherapy <laughs> and and crystals, lots of crystals. But um, the new thought thing, the new thought movement, kind of fragmented into several branches. There was a more realist branch that that really worked with what positive thinking can do for you without getting stupid about it. And then you had the extremist branch, which got into the no, no, the world will cater to you. The, the sort of thing that gave rise to that that dreadful book, The Secret, that lost so much money for so many people. Um, so Norman Vincent Peale was very much in the in the sort of moderate, sensible end of things. And he, he wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking and things like that. He wrote a lot of books. Um, he was he was quite a significant figure at that time. And a lot of people in, in New York City went to his church. And Donald Trump was one of them. In fact, um, Donald Trump married his first wife in, in that church. And so, yeah, he but the thing is, an enormous number of people absorbed that kind of thing. If it wasn't from Peel, it was one of, from one of 150,000 other teachers um, trotting around the American landscape who were teaching the same thing. Is Trump good at putting that into effect? Yes, he is. That's why he's you know, worth a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, but you don't think that's the major, try, the major factor? Well, I think, the thing is, I think it's an important factor because um, 
one of the one of the advantages that Trump has that his his rival the politicians who rival him do not have is that he actually had to do his stuff in a setting where he could lose. Mm-hmm. He had you know he was out there in the business world. He was doing he was a real estate magnate, and he was spending a lot of time and a lot of hard work building on the fortune that he inherited and building it up to its you know to a significant level before he decided to get into entertainment instead. Um, and so he was testing this stuff where most politicians, I mean, let, let, let us set aside for a moment all of the, the sort of warm, fuzzy, democratic talk at this point. American politics is very corrupt. Mm-hmm. Um, you can buy a Senate seat, you, as Hillary Clinton did, for example. You can buy a, a seat in the House of Representatives. Your, your a political career in America, mostly involves a good st- a good lump of money to start with, and then a willingness to sell out to um, you know as many buyers as possible, so that you can amass the money you need for your next campaign. And so, if you can get into the game, you're kind of you, you just sort of circle there, doing the same thing over and over again. So we end up with um, a political system that is full of profoundly mediocre people. Because once they can figure out how to, you know, how how to sell out, basically, they have no worries. They're not going to lose an election. They, you know, the elections are bought and paid for them. You know, we have a lot of voting fraud over here. And so, so here's Donald Trump, who ha- who actually has had to test his approach to life in the world of business, and he's facing a bunch of politicians who have never had to test their um, their beliefs against anything, you know, and this gives him an advantage. This gives him a substantial advantage, whereas a lot of the people who are trying to use positive thinking against him don't have that advantage, and so they don't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Something, you, something you said there about, um, you know, politicians buying the seat, getting into this position, and they just have to remain mundane. Um, this mm-hmm. sort of comes up in the in the, the pieces um, that you sent, which which I read through, which is the, the you have this opinion of which which I would agree with that it seems that. Western politics, in, at least for those who are in power, is a form of sort of sunk cost Leninism, where mm-hmm. if once you've got the power, you understand that is all the power you're getting. You can you can get more, but if you want to hold on to it and if you want to get more, you need to toe the line. Like, mm-hmm. and you exactly. need to toe the line in an almost um, you know hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Like just. Pure oh, ignorance, it, just oh, it has, it has to be absolute blind faith. Absolute, you do exi- the, the level of conformism, crushing conformism, in the upper middle and upper classes of American society these days. You have to see it to believe it. Um, it's astonishing, especially if you are trying to claw your way up from below. The example that I used in the piece that um, the pieces that you have is going through the university system in America, where you know if you get into one of the one of the privileged universities, one of the big name universities, you, as long as you as long as your dad doesn't your mom and dad don't run out of money, you can't fail. Seriously, you cannot fail. People will the, – the, the, the university will do everything to make sure you graduate at the end of four years with a prestigious degree, blah, 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 which means absolutely nothing. But it means that you've towed the line. Mm-hmm. It means that you have received the polish, made the connections, um, done the things you're supposed to do, and you are now a qualified um, aspirant to wealth and power. And then, you know, you get a position in a, in a corporate bureaucracy. You get a position in the federal bureaucracy. You begin working your way up a little at a time. You, you run for a small political office somewhere. And at each level, you are, you, you're vetted by the people who are already at that level and by the people who are above them. You know, does he have any, does he have any crazy ideas? Mm-hmm. Does he do everything that he's supposed to do and nothing that he's not supposed to do? It, the thing is, this happens in every society. That was the case in Britain. I mean, it may still be the case in Britain, as far as I know, but it's certainly the case in Britain um, up through the Second World War, which is one of the reasons why why Britain by Britain had so many bad generals, uh, and um, <clears throat> and so, so yeah, you get you get this situation where it's a sorting by conformity, and so the the degree of groupthink, the blind groupthink you get in the upper in the upper echelons is just stunning. And it explains, I think, a lot of the of the psychotic break that we've seen um, in recent years and, and a lot of the mindless hostility toward Trump and, and his supporters because they're, they didn't do 
They don't do what they're supposed to do. Trump doesn't get the right kind of haircut. He doesn't wear the right kind of clothes. He doesn't have the right kind of ideas and the right kind of voice and any of this stuff. He's crude. He's crass. He's brash. He's loud. Um, he has, you know, gold-plated toilet seats. He, <laughs> hmm. you, and, and that's the thing that offends him. It's 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 a class thing. Do you think he's sincere though in what he, um, should we say, promises to do politically? Um, well, he certainly did a better job of keeping his promises than any other president presidential candidate in my lifetime. Um, I don't know how sincere he is. I know that he, you know, he he has an ego the size of all outdoors, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he clearly has has remade himself, you know, just as he remade himself from real estate um, promoter to reality TV show host and so on. He has remade himself now as you know heroic president doing battle against the deep state in the swamp. And he will play that role absolutely to the hilt. That's what he does. And to the extent that he can succeed in doing so, I think a lot of people will be better off. Although it won't be the, the people who are better off will not be the people in the professional classes, of course. Okay. Who do, who do you think would be better off under Trump? Oh, um, most working Americans. Mm-hmm. Most of the people I know who work for a living and who who make less than hundred thousand a year, hundred hundred fifty thousand a year, are actually doing considerably better now. Even with the economic restrictions caused by the coronavirus, we've had tax cuts that actually helped working class Americans. Wow. Uh, you know, rather than the usual, let's give some more away to the rich. Um, we've had um, very substantial decreases in joblessness. Um, especially in the um, some, the unskilled and semi-skilled categories, and especially in minority areas, we've had uh, the rate of job of the rate of business startups again until coronavirus happened was phenomenal. Um, a lot of the changes that he made have actually helped a lot of people, and of course he got rid of the Obamacare boondoggle, um, which was hurting a lot of people too. So. I th- you know he already has helped a lot of people, and this despite four years of constant. You know, sniping from the other side. Mm-hmm. Do you think he'll win again in in November? Yeah, my working guess is that he's going to win by a comfortable majority. Yeah, that's um, the same as me. everything. Everything that I've seen. Well, uh, here, here's an example. Watching the polls has been entertaining because if you know where to look, you can find out how they're choosing their samples. Mm-hmm. And the mainstream polls are oversampling Democrats to a dram- to a, uh, an astonishing degree. Yeah. Um, the the latest one from um, the Economist slash YouGov. Um, they were oversampling Democrats by 14 percent, and even so, they were only having Biden ahead by 8 percent. Wow. See, I, I just so, don't want to trust them because I remember the 2016 election. I remember so many places saying, oh, there's a 1 percent chance Trump will win, which is even even, oh, yeah. even near the end of the election. It's like, no, 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 that's you're just being hysterical. Like, you you know, use your eyes. Yeah, point, exactly. You know, even saying 10 percent, you'd go, OK, you know, you're still being a bit silly. But saying 1 percent, you're like, no, you're just being a child. Uh-huh. You know, and not and not sort of admitting to the reality that you're yeah, faced, and and that's the, that's the whole thing. They've reached the point of believing that if they say something, the universe has to follow it. <laughs> you know, if 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 Nate Sil- I mean, I honestly, if Nate Silver at this point opened his mouth and said the sky is blue, I'd go check. <laughs> you know, this is the guy who insisted that. Um, yeah, he, this is one of the guys who was who claimed that Trump had like one percent a one percent chance of winning. He's saying the same thing now. Yeah, Why crazy. anybody gives him any credibility at this point, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. So let's let's move into the uh, the 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 frog meat, shall we say? <laughs> um, but there, there, there's a little thing which I actually put down on my questions, and then after I'd written the questions from the bits you sent, uh, I realised this is actually in the the blurb, the description for your book on Amazon now. Um, so in you actually already mentioned World War Two, so it's strange that it come up came up. But in World War Two, there is a there is a secret World War Two that not many people know about, uh, which is the mm-hmm. the secret occult war of World War Two, uh, which was sort of I believe led or Dion Fortune was a big part of this. Um, you know, mm-hmm. She wrote a book uh, about it, which I think is just called the is it called the secret the occult the, the magical occult, the magical the magical battle, battle of, Britain. of Britain yeah the so, magical battle of Britain is the title yeah. Um, for p- people who didn't don't know about this, this uh, as Britain was obviously fighting Hitler and the Allies versus. Uh, mm-hmm. Every everyone from the Allied side was well, not not everyone. Sorry, all the occultists of the Allied uh, the Allied side was sort of putting everything they could together, and you know, f- f- uh, let's just say firing it or, or casting it towards um, 
They're enemies. Now... Well, actually, not quite. No? Not quite. No? You, okay. you missed the central point here. Um, okay, the, the general opinion on all sides in Europe in 1939 and, and immediately thereafter is that there was a core of, of um, organized occult activity involved with the Nazi party. And there's a lot of historical evidence for that. Mm -hmm. um, the Nazi party itself was founded as a political action wing of a secret society, the Tule Gesellschaft. And, and, you know, so, and all, many, many of the top Nazis had substantial backgrounds in occultism. Hitler was one of them. Um, so the idea was that the Nazis were in fact, you know, use, one of the things they were doing as part of of their program to take over the world was throwing nasty magic at their opponents. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the hypothesis is this is why countries collapsed totally instead of putting up a determined resistance. Why, and France had a bigger army than Germany had in 1940. France forced Britain together. They, they had more tanks, more planes, more soldiers. What happened? The French army disintegrated. Mm -hmm. And the theory is that the, the theory that's been tossed around in occult circles is that the Nazis were doing something to maximize fear. Mm -hmm. They were doing something that was that we were doing magical workings intended to cause people to panic and break. Now, what Dion Fortune et al. did, what, they, what the occultists in England did, and it was very well organized, and she was kind of the center of it, but lots of different groups rallied around, um, was not to attack Germany. It was to build up Britain. This is actually the, the secret of effective magical combat. If you go at the other side, you entangle yourselves with them. And there are various kinds of blowback that can happen. And it's a real mess. You win in a magical combat by building yourself up, by strengthening yourself, by, um, ta by, by casting off the other, the other side's moves. Let them waste their energy on you while you build you to, to, you know, into, a, into a position of strength where their work can't affect you. And then blowback hits and down they go. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so we had, what we had in, world, in the magical side of World War II was a contest between two different modes of magical combat. The Nazi mode, which was attack them, and the, the British mode, which was no, we're just going to defend ourselves. We're going to build ourselves up. You'll notice who won. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a lesson that a lot of people have not learned, and especially on the left, surprisingly. You'd think they'd be paying attention. But when Trump won, and this is something I'll be discussing at some length in, in The King in Orange, when Trump won, what happened, what, one of the things that happened, one of the many things that happened, was there was this vast upsurge of people from the leftward end of things who wanted to cast curses and you know, evil magic and um, destructive magic at Trump at his supporters, making all the same mistakes the Nazis did. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I remember and, uh, which, which, witches for Bernie or witches for Hillary, I think. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, and but especially after the election, oh good lord, there there are, there are a couple of books written for the with spells for the magic resistance. Resistance. Notice the thing. They're all focused on resisting. They're not focused on doing something positive. Purely on resisting someone else. That is failure. It's failure in military strategy. It's failure in magic. It's failure feeding, in anything. Isn't that feeding the beast? Because you're yeah. If uh, all you're yeah. If all you're doing is resisting the other side, you're not making any movements toward your own goals. You're just sitting there. Mm -hmm. And and while the, while the other side by that point was actually pursuing its own goals with a fair amount of enthusiasm. Which I think so, you can see this if uh, from a third part like third party position. If you see these mm -hmm. two sides and you see the left who are just literally shrieking and throwing everything they have and quite literally screaming and having these hysterics. And the other side mm -hmm. just sort of stood there going, we're still going to do what we're going to do. From that other position, you go, well, who do I want to, you know, who do I want to be <laughs> with, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, at, at this point, um, one of the most effective slogans that the Republican Party has right now is, the, the, we're starting to see billboards with this, um, had enough, vote Republican. And the thing is, enormous numbers of people in America have had more than – people who would normally support a Democratic candidate are saying, eh, it's going to be straight Republican ticket this time because I just want them to shut up. Stop throwing tantrums. Start, stop shrieking in outrage. Stop burning down buildings and beating people because they can't handle the fact that Hillary Clinton lost. Yeah, I was going to ask. I mean, the fact that everyone intuitively knows – Two words, you know, had enough. And everyone has their own sort of subjective intuition of what enough is. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. would you describe, you know, enough of what? what? How would you, what are people sick of? 
Um, basically, there is a, a small C conservative aspect to the American people, which is not often noticed. People want, most Americans want to be left alone. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be harassed. They want to go up through their lives and, you know, work at their jobs and get their paychecks and, you know, do whatever, you know, raise their families and this kind of stuff. They don't want to be constantly being pestered. Mm -hmm. And the Democratic Party has been throwing us and, and, and his various hangers on have been throwing a series of of tirades, tantrums, really. So you're a three-year-old, fling yourself on the ground, pound your fists on the uh, drum your heels, shriek at the top of your lungs, tantrums to try to get people to um, well, do what they want. And all it's doing is annoying people. <laughs> and so I think the enough is, can, and can we please go back to having, to just living our lives? Mm -hmm. Can well, we please, yeah, you know, just go back to going to our job, you know, doing our jobs, getting our paychecks, raising our families, um, you know, maybe going for a vacation to, to Branson, Missouri, um, every so often or what have you, or Disneyland. Um, and since the Democrats have fixated on the idea that this, this can't be allowed to happen, that everyone has to be made miserable until they get what they want. Again, it's the logic of the three-year-old who, who insists on having a candy bar and, and melts down in the middle of the store when, when it's not forthcoming. Um, I honestly think they're going to do very, very poorly in this coming election, possibly much more poorly than anybody thinks. Yeah, I think I think there's some serious truth in that. I recently had a discussion, um, someone who'd recently written a biography of Machiavelli, and people mm -hmm. try sort of um, pigeonhole him and say, oh, he was a Republican, he was a you know, fascist, or he was blah, 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 blah. And something, you know, one thing this scholar made clear is, well, in Machiavelli's day, you, that form of political thought wasn't a thing. People weren't political. And I think this mm -hmm. is something that within modern society, this is something that the left has brought forward and has become f so utterly pronounced that it's like n you can't ignore it anymore in recent years since sort of um, 2008, since Obama. Mm -hmm. It's every single action. And I, I, you know, I don't mean that in sort of uh, hy hyperbole. And I mean every single action to the point where it's every like buying socks is a yeah. can be a political choice. And the left yeah. wants it to be. Whereas, as you were mm -hmm. saying, people want to be left alone. People, People don't want to have to, con you know, what kind of burger am I cooking? Are these buns racist? You know, is this, you know, you know what I mean, though, but uh, that's what. Oh, yes. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. You know, they're bringing me a drink. That's a plastic straw. <laughs> you know, am I destroying the planet? Exactly. Where everything has to mean. Actually, you know, you have just, I had not thought of this before, but this makes an enormous amount of sense in terms of. The idea that what's going on is a, is a psychotic break. One of the things that consistently happens in schizophrenia is delusions of reference. The idea that everything means something. <laughs> Every, and it all focuses around whatever your central delusion is. If you believe that you know, the, the Illuminati are out to get you, they're beaming thoughts into your head with their orbital mind control lasers. Everything around you has to show signs that the Illuminati is watching. Look, that woman stopped. She stopped in front of the in front of the shop mirror or in front of the shop glass. She's using a mirror. She's spying on me. Everything has to fit that. And I think seeing what the left is going on is, is going on about these days as a collection of delusions of reference in support of, of you know, a, a, a schizophrenic worldview, a psychotic worldview. Actually, that makes an enormous amount of sense. I had not thought of that before. And I think I want to factor that in. <laughs> You know, the thing I was sort of going towards there is most people don't want to be political beings all the time. Exactly. And mm -hmm. I, I actually remember, it's strange, you know, in my lifetime, I remember um, asking my high school headmaster what who he was voting. So this would have only been sort of uh, like 16 years ago or whatever. And mm -hmm. he said, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to tell you because it's the last private thing. So in the space of 16 years, it's gone from the last private thing to the first thing. Right. Mm -hmm. You, you know, dating sites now. Are you conservative? Right. Don't talk to me. Uh, you know, what shop, what shops, mm -hmm. what shops do you shop at? What clothes do you wear? What do you eat? You mm -hmm. know, and it's like, can't we, can't we just live first? And then if that's really, is that really that important to you? You know, mm -hmm. on a day to day but, level, you know, how do you yeah. comport yourself as I am like a conservative being? It's like, well, chill out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Most, and, and the thing is, most people are wise. 
not to want any particular political involvement because it's you know you're not actually going to be able to make any significant change unless you in, unless you're willing to invest your whole life in it and certainly doing by way of what clothes you wear and whether there's a, a plastic straw in that drink that's not going to change anything mm-hmm. and so you know you you need you need to budget your time and your emotional energy and say okay what is important to me for most people politics is never going to be that important and nor, nor should it be there are many other things to do with one's life but um yeah and i think that's that's what a lot of the had enough is about the relentless politicization the relentless delusions of refer- imposition of delusions of reference all over everything so that no matter what it is, it must tie into the master delusion. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fun- funnily enough, um, just sort of a, another little digression before we get into the uh, the other occult war that's going on. I actually have Christopher Lash's Culture of Narcissism next to me. And mm-hmm. I, I think that sort of factors in that narcissism that it's not mm-hmm. necessarily that you're trying to change the world in a collective sense. It's like, look at me. I am. Oh, yeah. I am left. I am vegan, or you know, mm-hmm. I have no problem with these things. But it's more about the appearance of the virtue as opposed to the virtue in itself. Well, I, I think a lot of what's happening is that is that people people have no actual sense of self. A great many people have. They've never. I mean, they've been had the media yelling at them twenty four seven all through their lives. They've never taken the time to stop and think and reflect on themselves and decide. You know, what do I want? What am I? What, what do I want out of life? And so since they don't, since they have a very stunted sense of self, they fill it in with, with all these political things. You know, I am virtuous. I'm going to engage in, in um, socially correct or politically correct virtue signaling here because that says who I am. I'm taking my identity off the rack from, you know, from a secondhand store. But that doesn't matter. It's the only identity I've got. Yeah. Quite coincidentally, actually, someone sent me yesterday one of the official um, lots of marketing things from one of the uh, you know, member, b- bigger members of the um, Democratic Party. And one of their sort of quotes is, you know, oh, we believe in freedom and f- greater freedom of consumer choice. That's a paraphrase, but that is... Greater uh, freedom. That's greater freedom. freedom of consumer choice, yeah. And, and it, while at the same time, what that amounts to is greater freedom to choose things that big corporations have already selected already for, you. for you. Yeah. You've, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, um, yeah the, if you ever want to freak one of these people out, tell them that you don't have a cell phone. <laughs> Better yet, tell them you don't own a television. I have had people literally come unglued on me. Hmm. What do it's you do? Funny. What do you do? How do you exist? How do oh, yeah. yeah? How do you exi- how do you exist if you're not if you're not sitting there for four to six hours a night with drool puddling on your lap? What you know as some um, you know this is some some a collection of, of idiotic little skits dance around a glass screen. And of course, don't ever mention to the, don't ever ask them why it is they call it <clears throat> programming. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know I think another way to freak them out is to take a clear choice such as that and say you know you're allowed mm-hmm. to not do that. And they go. Yeah. Mm, you know, you can sort of see the cogs. You know, the rust mm-hmm. is flying away uh-huh. from the cogs. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Anyway, let's let's get into the uh, the 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 occult war that's going on now that you state, mm-hmm. which is under the banner of a lovely, friendly, cozy cartoon frog named Pepe. Now. Uh, <laughs> Pepe, well, now the thing is, the, the Pepe Wars, the Keck Wars, as I've well <laughs> called them, that actually reached its peak with Trump's election in 2016. Mm-hmm. And that, that's, it started like so much on the internet um, in, in 4chan, in, in the chans, the, the network of um, unmoderated, uninhibited, uncontrolled, unconventional craziness that takes place in what started out as a bunch of anime fan sites. Um, I mean, the, these these things have been major sources of internet creativity. Um, most of our listeners probably know what a lol cat is. <laughs> Fortran invented lol cats. Um, a lot of the things, the memes, internet memes, are are a creation of this underworld. But one of the things to remember is that a lot of the people who are in this this sort of online underworld, a lot of the people who who spend their hours on the chance, have gone there because there's no other place for them in society, because. Um, 
you know, the job we, we until quite recently, until 2016, entry level jobs were incredibly hard to come by. Um, unemployment was basically guaranteed. You can go to college and get a four year degree. You're going to graduate with, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars in debt and no job to pay it. Um, so there was an enormous number of people who were getting nowhere in life, who were living typically in their mom's basements because that's all they could do. They had no money. They had no future. And so they got together on the chance to talk, to watch anime, to, to chat about video games, and, and to hang out with other people who had the similar experience in life. That, that's the area that, uh, where um, you know, the sort of, the sort of um, Gary Lackman-style um, observers of the occult community, that's, that's where they're not looking. Mm-hmm. That's where most people don't look. Everyone wants to look at the intellectuals, the philosophers. Real change begins you know, in bars, it begins in you know in in, in lower class pubs. It begins in um, on on website forums that nobody in their right mind would frequent unless they don't have anything else to do. And so that's where that got going. And you had you had a lot of people there who were who were aware to one degree or another of the mess that that they had been handed by a society that that really didn't care. And then Donald Trump. Then came Donald Trump. And of course, they loved him partly for sheer parodic value. Because, I mean, here, here we have a, a world wrestling promoter. We have a, a you know reality TV star, and he's running for president. And he's saying things that are offending everyone. Of course, they take pile them. Of course, they and, and then they they, dis, they discovered that what he was saying might actually make a difference in their lives, and the you know loyalty followed. And it just got stranger from there. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things I find that still makes me really, really laugh is there's this old um, 4chan post which has been um, sort of screenshotted because obviously, I think uh, just a very brief overview for people who don't know what 4chan is it's, uh, and the chans, they are very, very, like as bare bones forums as you could get. Someone posts something, mm-hmm. you comment, no one has usernames, it's just completely anonymous, absolutely no rules except sort of like illegal stuff. So it's as rule free and, and, and anarchic Mm -hmm. as you can imagine. And what makes me, what makes me laugh is like, if you went on 4chan sort of 10, like if you went on 4chan prior to Trump, Mm -hmm. because it was such a radical place, a lot of the politics. So if you want 4chan uh, forward slash poll, which is politically incorrect, they Mm -hmm. would be backing what then was considered radical politics, which was, you know, radical left wing, sort of everyone was an, you know, an anarchist or a Marxist or a communist or something. That was what was radical then. And there's this Mm -hmm. brilliant post sort of from the beginnings of the Trump era. And it says like, you know, here we are now on 4chan backing the new radical politics, quoting William Buckley Jr., and I love it because because the politics, <laughs> what is radical, has gone from like you know Che Che Guevara and uh, you mm-hmm. know shooting the landlords to how about we just are able to afford a home, have a nice family, mm-hmm. and be left alone. Mm-hmm. And that exactly. transition is is one of the most important things I think to recognize. Oh yeah. Well, this, we we talked about it earlier because when when. Um... The, the the whole Tony Blairite business, the whole you know the, the 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 you get a situation where the managerial class, the professional class, takes over the left, reworks it into a bastion of the status quo and of, of their own class privilege. What's left for the radicals, but to go to the other extreme, mm-hmm. to take over the right and turn into a battering ram against those walls of privilege. And that's what happened. I mean, Che Guevara is a, is a, is a, commercial, a commercial commodity these days. You can go to upscale stores and get a, TV, get a T-shirt with his face printed on it. He's no threat to the status quo. He is the status quo. And so, you know, the, the folks on 4chan responded accordingly and said, okay, well, if that's the status quo, yeah, William F. Buckley, Norman Vincent Peale, um, and and away they went. Mm-hmm. And of course, where Magic got into it is simply because as they got more and more involved in the whole Trumpista thing, somewhere around there, somewhere I think around the beginning of 2016, some people started running across Chaos Magic, which is a very simplified form of magical practice. And it's one that's very well suited for use on the internet because it, it works with what are called sigils, mm-hmm. which are images on which you can concentrate. Internet memes make great sigils. And so all the memesters there were going, whoa, you're talking like meme magic, cool. And so they, they were all over it. 
I mean, I, I apologize for the sort of 60s thing, but that's still, you know, given when I grew up, that's still what I think of in terms of youth culture. It's still right. <laughs> and so... Um, and so they piled into Chaos Magic, and for a while there, you had literally people teaching online classes through the chans, saying, this is how you make a meme, this is how you make a sigil, this is how you concentrate on it, here's how you get a bunch of people working together on it. And so all of these folks were doing this stuff, and then they started to get synchronicities. They started getting weird coincidences that went their way. They started noticing clusters of numbers showing up. That's something all, all the chance. They since each post is anonymous, everyone gets an, a random num- or gets a sequential number added to it. Mm-hmm. And so there there had been this sort of playful thing. How can you get double numbers? Can you get tripled numbers? How about quadruple? And every time people started talking about Trump, they started as they get. They started getting these clusters of numbers. I think it was in, was in May or June. Somebody just posted Trump will win. And it had seven 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 as its number. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so everyone was going, "Whoa, man, <laughs> <laughs> we've gone too far." Yeah, but so yeah, the, the thing is, this is this is something that everybody everybody who does practical magic has what we call the TSW moment. I'm going to give the polite version. Oh, no, this you can, you can stuff the... works. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It's this stuff works, we'll say, and it does. But when you when you hit that moment, when you do something and it functions, you always the first time that happens to you, you're gonna freak out. Everybody does, and then you typically. I mean, I I don't I I don't remember how many times I've fielded the panicked phone call or the panicked email or what have you for somebody who just had something work and they're literally coming unglued because oh my god, TSW. <laughs> So the chans went through some some serious TSW in this process, and then of course they piled into the whole Trumpista thing. Um, they had, of course, Pepe was their, you know, as the archetypal slacker, was their their mascot anyway. And all of a sudden, Pepe started becoming a political thing. And then somebody, and of course, somebody noticed that there was an Egyptian frog god named Kek, and we could get into the long story of how Kek came into the the the, the chans term for laughter. But and it just it just piled up one one apparent coincidence after another pushing toward the idea that there was something moving toward making Trump um, president of the United States and then of course he won. Do you think this? Do you think this? Uh, these forces and this magic and this um, this sort of underground communal thing is still pushing Trump now, and it or is it? Oh, oh good, it's good. Do you oh, think no, it's no. been changed? Well, there it it varies. Um, there are people on because the. It was kind of an alliance of convenience and also, of course, a, a, a grand practical joke. And then people went, oh, my God, it works. And so you have some people who are much further to the right than Trump is. You have people who are you know, literally Nazis um, who are really upset because Trump has, has a Jewish son-in-law. <laughs> they can't handle that. And he's like cool with Israel. They can't handle that. So they're not on, they're not on Trump's side. And you have various other people who veered off other ways, but you also have a fair number of people who flow, who followed that whole thing and became serious Trump supporters. Yeah. And there are whole forums these days for people who are, you know, hardcore Trumpistas. You also have people who went from that original involvement with chaos magic to more serious magical practices, and a lot of those are doing stuff with a Trump with a Trumpista end in mind. So the magical war is still continuing. It's not as colorful as it once was because they have learned one of the basic lessons of magic, which their opponents on the left have not learned, which is that you keep your mouth shut when you're doing magic. Don't get, don't, don't, you know, uh, let your energy overflow into your your opponents. They can use it. Yes, but also don't tell the other side what you're doing before you're doing it. I mean, if you're playing poker and you show the other guy your cards, you just lost. Yeah. Yeah. That's also one of the basic rules of magic, especially if there are people who disagree with you who are working magic the other way around. Don't let it out because people can, you know, if you announce the details of your spell all over the Internet, that's indeed the, the let many people on the left have been doing. It's really easy to take that ritual, figure out how to, how to monkey wrench it and make it completely ineffective. And I think that's one of the reasons why, despite the united opposition of the entire political class, Trump has not only survived, he's gotten a lot done. Yeah. What would your predictions be for the, uh, the, you know, the end of the Trump era? Where does this energy go eventually? 
Um, what I think it, a lot depends on what happens this November. Mm-hmm. If Trump wins substantial, I mean, if he, if he if he ekes out a narrow win, or if he loses, we're going to see years of conflict ahead. Yeah. Well, things sort out between. Well, things get all sorted out between, you know, the the representatives of the, of the professional class and the rep- and the managerial class. That whole thing, and the rising insurgency from from the working classes and ordinary people. Um, if he wins by a substantial margin, game over. Um, and especially if the Republicans can take the House back, because I, at this point, they were fairly tentative in um, in 2016, 2017, 2018. It was all, well, you know, at this point, the Democrats have made so many enemies that I think what will happen in um, if the Republicans can get both houses of Congress and hold on to the White House is that we're going to see a whole bunch of legislation that is going to cut the legs out from under the power of the managerial class. It would not be hard. It would not be difficult at all. All you have to do is undercut the universities and um, impose some some well, basically re- reenact some laws that were taken off the media and a few other places. We used to think of the fairness doctrine where, where the media actually had to give both sides of every story. Mm-hmm. That was that was abolished um, some time ago, and it could be reenacted, and <laughs> things would change in a hurry, and, and you know, and, and so on and so forth. There there are fairly simple things that could be done um, that would basically leave the leave the managerial class cut cut down to size, and I think that's going to if if there is a significant Trump victory, that's going to happen. We'll pat we will pass through a significant watershed in America's public life, and on the far side of it, I think things may calm down a bit. I'm th- I'm saying this because this has happened before. Um, in the 1930s, uh, 1932, Franklin Roosevelt became president. He was hated by the power sh- the the powerful of his time. The political class loathed him. The rich said he's a traitor to his class. They despised him. They played all kinds of, legis- of, of legislative and legal tricks against his administration. And then the 1936 election came around, and he won um, 46 of the then 48 states. And all of a sudden, the opposition imploded. You know, poop. And we had a very different world for a while. And so I think we, we, we are really at that kind of inflection point where if Trump can, care, can, can succeed in, in, having, in winning a decisive victory, even, even if he's not on an FDR scale, I think a lot of the screaming and shouting, people will just go, okay, enough of this crap. Hmm. Okay. Um well, I'll just run run an idea by you. I mean, I recently spoke to Curtis Yarvin. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. But mm-hmm. Oh, Mencius Moldbug, yeah. Yeah, Mencius Moldbug. I recently had an interview of him. Now, obviously, cool. he's he's one of the more prominent writers, shall we say, on the right or on the on, oh, on, the, on the not left. <laughs> one, one, yeah, one of, one of the founders of the alt right, I would say. Uh, yeah, I don't think I, I think he influenced them, but I don't think he con- he doesn't consider himself. Oh right, because I think that just oh, I'm sure he, changed. I'm sure he, no, he says he is his own thing, but it's because of his work that the all right exists. Yeah, that it got started. Okay. Yeah. Um. So his he he's he is voting Biden. Um, yeah. Now that doesn't surprise me at all. He's voting Biden because he believes that um, the longer there is something for the left to push against, the longer they can retain some co- coherency. But if you have Biden in and the left no longer have something to push against. They will just ex- like implode because they no longer have anything to say to people. Look, this is the problem. This is the problem. And once they're left to their own devices with, uh, you know, potentially dementia ridden Biden as their leader, mm-hmm. they will just go sort of mad. What do you what do you make of that theory? Um, I think it's plausible, but I think they could do far much, far too much damage to the country before they finish imploding. Okay. Um, I just think I think. Especially at this point, when they have gone, the the Democratic Party has gone so extreme. They've embraced all kinds of, frankly, whack job beliefs at this point, and I think they could just cause way too much damage. I think it's better to um, slap them down hard, and if if at all possible, deprive them of the House of Representatives, and um, you know, so they can. Yes, they can still push against something, but. What? How much food is going to do if their if their institutional, organizational, and financial foundations are dropping away from underneath them? That's what I expect to have happen. I understand. I understand Yarvin's idea, but I, I think he's. I think his strategy is wrong. Okay. What do you think of Yarvin's writing? Um, interesting, misguided, um, thought provoking. 
I certainly hope that um, his ideas never become the, the political mainstream, but I'm glad to have some interesting thought about um, about, th- about things that you were not supposed to think about. It's, it's good stuff okay. for that. Um, do you mind if I ask, will you actually be voting or are you just sort of... Oh, of course I'm going to vote. Vote for Trump? I was vote. I, I was, well, I'm, I, we have a thing called a secret ballot in the United States. And so um, I, I do not, as a matter of course, say who I'm voting for. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. But, I, what, but I, am looking, I am looking forward to casting my ballot. Okie dokie. So what, what's your sort of plans for election night then? Oh, um, let's see. Election. Now, one of the things um, here in Rhode Island, along with a lot of states, there's a lot of early voting. You can actually go in and vote some days prior to election day. They're trying to sort of space things out so that it's less of a crowd. Um, I, I plan on having a perfectly ordinary evening. Um, once let's see, once the polls start closing, I will you know go online and see. Um, probably actually go to the BBC website, which um, you know Beeb, the the Beeb has its problems, but it actually has a fair. It actually does fairly good coverage of American elections when they're happening. You know the the. Um, their live reporting is is decent, or at least amusing. Yeah, to be fair, like they, they uh, it's, it's extremely practical when it comes to this thing. But but outside of that, I mean, uh, you know, one of my predictions for the future actually is like within ten years there won't be a BBC because they are just oh. they are like you know submachine guns akimbo shooting themselves in the foot. You know, this is no longer. Oh, yeah. No, the 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 be the, the be if I, I mean I mean it's 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 up to it's up to you guys. I'm an American citizen. It's not my business, but. If I were if I were a British subject, I would want um, to see the BBC um, no longer supported by tax revenue and forced to sink or swim on its own. Yeah, yeah. I think and, a, a, you know, the, the defund the BBC campaigns getting big. I, um, I'm I'm delighted. I'm delighted to hear it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think this is. Uh, is there anything you? Do? So your book is out in June. Um, book is I'll, out in June. I will link the the Keck War, the four part Keck War series in the mm-hmm. description below, so people can get a taste. Um, is there anything else we can sort of expect from you in the coming months before June? Um, let's see. I've I've finished finally. I finished my eleven volume fiction project, uh, the the um, the Weird of Holly and its its companion novels. That's that's finally all in print. Um, and for those who don't know, it's basically H.P. Lovecraft told from the other side. Um, you know, there are two sides to every story, right? So maybe the tentacled horrors and their sinister cultists actually have a different view of things. Well, they do in my in my fictive world, at least. And there's a lot of tentacles uh, and various other things and a lot of in jokes. But so that's that's out of the way. I'm I'm kind of catching my breath before doing my next um, my next major fiction project. I have a variety of nonfiction projects in the works. I don't think any of them are actually going to hit the. Um, hit the bookshelves before June, just kind of a little hiatus. I have also had one of my publishers dropped a number of my books, and so I'm having having to like get them back out for another publisher. Okay. But so that's that's taken out a lot of a lot of my time. But other than that, I expect to be writing. I expect to be blogging. I expect to be annoying the the defenders of the conventional wisdom and the status quo. Sounds great, uh, John Michael Greer. <laughs> thanks for coming on. Uh, thank you very much for having me on.